I feel the need, the need for speed. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about that, but the stuff that comes before the speed part, which is a pre-flight check. So if you are not familiar, I have a video talking about event modeling. Today we are going to be walking through a real life event modeling exercise with an SME. And this is the very talented, very original Mark D'Angelo, who is a PhD aerospace engineer. And he's going to be walking me through how he, as a pilot, does his pre-flight check and how you, as a data scientist, can walk through how to do this event modeling exercise with your SME. And at the end, we're going to have an event model that needs to be cleaned up by the data scientists. And I'm going to have the final production for you so you can check out how that looks. All right, so if this sounds interesting to you, hang on to your butts because we're in for a ride. So today we are going to go through that interview process. How do you actually work with the SME to understand how that event model should actually look and to make sure that you're not getting it wrong. So Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? So I'm Mark D'Angelo, um, aerospace engineer. But I would say before that, I was always an aviation enthusiast. And then <laughs> um, I got Microsoft Flight Simulator. I got really into that. I did a master's. It involved unmanned aircraft. Uh, it was a mm -hmm. op search optimization technique. So how do you mm -hmm. maximize mm -hmm. ground area search? It was a big multi-dimensional optimization problem and uh, then you know as I was getting closer to finishing that my academic advisor says have you thought about staying on for a PhD I think you'd be good at that there was an interesting project that I could do and continue and mm -hmm. uh, this one involved merging both of my uh, favorite things and that is uh, aviation and photography so this is uh, an algorithm that I developed um, to determine the location of an aircraft without GPS. So mm. you can think of it as looking out the window, looking at what you see on the ground and all the different landmarks, mm -hmm. and then computing where you think you are. Um, <laughs> but this is automating that. So mm -hmm. you sensor data from the aircraft that measure its roll, uh, its pitch, its yaw, its altitude, its airspeed, and combining those measurements with a picture of the ground. So like downward facing camera, looking at the ground, mm -hmm. extracting features from that, identifying landmarks, and comparing those landmarks with a reference image or a reference map. And so you associate that with the uh, reference map and depending on where those landmarks appear in the image, mm -hmm. you can estimate uh, the location of your aircraft. And, so to uh, speak, you were almost like vectorization of your images to to help, right? So I do have a video on vectors. Anybody is interested in that? And Mark, I mean, you were talking a lot about things that I think we could definitely have whole other videos on some of those things because they're amazing. One thing that I think might be interesting for those that don't know much about the actual how do you fly something, how much goes into being able to physically see things when you're flying an aircraft versus like looking at all of the dashboard that you've got? Well, that's a great question because there are actually like two legal um, spots for that. There is something we call VFR flight, visual flight roles, where you are primarily responsible for looking outside and staying clear of other aircraft, mm -hmm. maintaining visual line of sight of the horizon, mm -hmm. and you know, you're flying uh, visually, so you really need to be uh, looking outside. You do reference your instruments um, so that you maintain your altitude and your heading, your airspeed. Mm -hmm. You don't want to fly too slow. You don't want to be flying too low. You don't, you know, mm -hmm. there's you know, <laughs> fit parameters. But yeah. then something called, and, if, and you need a separate rating to do um, instrument flight rules. So I And what does rating mean? So what that means is um, when you do flight training, you start as a student pilot. Mm -hmm. And there's an actual certificate that says you're a student pilot. So you have to go through that process and get a student pilot certificate. Then typically you get a private pilot certificate. I mean, you can get a sport pilot certificate or you could become a recreational pilot. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the certificate that gives you like the most freedom to, to mm -hmm. go 
everywhere in the national airspace is, is the private pilot certificate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that lets you fly VFR, visual flight rules. Mm -hmm. If you want to fly in conditions that are like, like where the clouds are very low or you're in fog, and in those conditions, you have to rely on your instruments. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. no horizon. Everything is just like a whiteout condition. Mark and I are kind of geeking out a little bit. We used to work <laughs> with each other, and I was on the engine. ground vehicle side yeah. a little bit. But then, like when I started to talk to Mark and his colleagues, I like dove headfirst into the aerospace side. So uh, I am nowhere near the expert that that Mark is. I personally don't have a PhD in what he has his PhD. My PhD is in data stuff, as you all probably know. Um, but we, I, you know, it's it's in my past as well, so I, I can geek out over this stuff. All right, so so Mark, let's start this interview process. So gonna we're just gonna go through, and what I'm going to do is, as you're talking, I'm going to be maybe making some nodes or some circles here. Um, for those in the knowledge graph space, these are not technically um, what you would consider the the node in a knowledge graph, but you could actually program it that way. So, Mark, there are other things that lead up to this event that we are going to be discussing today. So we want to be very careful to make sure people understand that. Yes, there's much planning that goes that's involved before you even go to the airport and get to the airplane. Yep. Um, that's all part of your pre-flight planning, your flight planning. We're going to be using a single engine airplane as an example today, particularly <laughs> Cessna 152, the airplane that I trained in, and we're going to be um, scoping this to a VFR flight, and um, we're not going to file a flight plan, um, okay. and we're not going to talk about all of the um, preparation you need to do before you even get to the airplane. So what I mean yes. by that is checking the weather, getting a weather brief, mm -hmm. um, even checking yourself and saying, okay, I got enough sleep. I'm not mm -hmm. being rushed. What are the weather conditions when I take off and route? Mm -hmm. When I land, um, can I make it? We're not going to be doing the, um, you know, the weight and balance calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're not going to be asking our passengers how much they weigh in this video. Um, there is many, and we're not going to be actually planning the route on our on our maps and on our, on our charts. So I'm really lucky in this case because Mark is very forthright in what is and is not in scope of this event model. But when you're doing this, you need to really understand what is the bounded context of the event that you are modeling. And that's really for you to make sure that you ask your subject matter expert if they don't come out and tell you all of it like Mark just did. Because if you don't understand where this event fits in to the larger scheme, even if you haven't modeled that part of, of the pipeline or the system or whatever it is that you're doing your event modeling on, uh, you're really not gonna get the right context. So some of the preconditions are some of the things that you mentioned a little bit earlier, Mark, where what kind of aircraft, what kind of, of uh, event plan are we actually walking through? So all of that is going to be our preconditions that you want to make sure that you outline. Okay, so first of all, um, I want to just preface it with, you know, there. why are we doing this? We're doing this because we have to. It's, it's the law, you know, pre-flight action. And we're going we're gonna to assume that, okay, we're at the airport. Everything else is cleared. Now we're going to actually, we're going to board this aircraft and we're going to take off and go. So we're going to start there. And so... When we do that, when we approach that airplane, we're already starting the checkout process. And um, we want to do this. This is very important because we're coming to this airplane fresh. I mean, some people rent airplanes. Some people own airplanes. Um, the airplanes are usually stored in a hangar somewhere, and usually other people have access to, to that space. So you don't know what could have possibly happened on accident, by accident on, to that airplane. So we mm -hmm. need to ensure that that airplane is airworthy and safe, that there's nothing that's going to um, cause uh, an accident later on while we're taking off or when we're en route. 
what we're going to be doing is we're going to be basically following a checklist. I'm going to be walking everyone through that because a checklist is important because it reduces the chances that an item will be overlooked. Mm -hmm. uh, so remember, the pilot in command is responsible for determining that the airplane is airworthy prior to every flight. So, so would you have that established already before you approach the plane? You would know who is the, the main pilot? Or is that something you would decide after approaching the pilot? You would, you would establish that during your um, flight planning. You might be flying by yourself, so that would make you the pilot in command. Maybe you'll pilot be flying with a, with a fellow pilot. You're going to want to approach it with the following supplies. You're going to want to perhaps have an aircraft checklist. These are usually stored in the aircraft, so you'll probably go inside to um, to obtain that. Right now, we're, we're filming this on a, on a cold winter day. Perhaps there is some frost on the aircraft. You want to remove all of the frost. You don't want to have any contamination. So um, if you're at a small airport, bring a spray bottle and, uh, and some, some de-icing fluid. Um, you know, even the automotive de-icing fluid works pretty well. I found that the, autom the fluid containing the glycols uh, work best. Um, another thing you're going to want to have is a flashlight if, it's, if these are nighttime operations. Or if you need to do some inspection and uh, maybe you need to look inside um, under a cowling for something. You know, maybe you detect something and you got to get a better look at it. Bring a flashlight. Uh, another thing is a fuel sampler cup. Many of these are provided in the airplane uh, if you rent them uh, at, at your local uh, fixed base operations. Or if you're an aircraft owner, you probably already have one of these. Um, paper towels, you're going to be checking oil. So uh, sometimes things can get a little messy, so you want to have some of that. And some windshield cleaner for airplanes uh, if necessary. Uh, airplanes fly pretty fast and sometimes bugs get in the way and then they, they block your view, they get stuck on the windscreen and you're spending all this money to fly an airplane so you, you'd it'd be best to have a really good view uh, to make your experience uh, all that much better. And plus sometimes bugs on the windscreen could maybe for, for a fraction of a second make you think that you're seeing air traffic when it's really not. So you want to minimize um, any of, anything that could obscure your view. Another thing is we're going to want to look at um, perhaps is, is the aircraft maintenance log book. Um, there's also something called a squawk sheet, you know, and uh, what that is, a, what? a squawk sheet, S-Q-U-A-W-K, like squawk. <laughs> it's more like pilot squawk slang. Sheet. Okay. Squawk. So that's if, 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 let's say you're not the only pilot who flies this airplane. Maybe somebody just got done flying it. And they wrote down that oh, there's a, a a slow oil leak or there's a you know there's some sort of uh, minor problem with it, and uh, then the mechanic could then take a look at it. Yeah, and another thing you've got to be aware of is any FAA or airworthiness directives on that airplane. Um, what that is is it's a it's it's a it's, it's a legal thing, and um, you you the operator must comply with an AD or an airworthiness directive. Otherwise. You know, I mean, it depends on the circumstances. We're not going to get all into that. Um, yep. But um, that's another thing to check for. And um, make a note of the date, the problems, any corrective action uh, taken by the mechanic. And now let's take So a are, those all are those two things separate from the squawk sheet? No, that's kind of part of it. Like if you're going to take a look at the maintenance manual, um, then, you know, also if... If there is a squawk sheet available, take a look at that too, basically. Give it an overall look, the airplane. You know, t take a step back, look at the entire thing before you get up and close. Because sometimes, like a wrinkle in the airplane's skin, any missing parts, or some other problem might be more obvious from a distance. Mm -hmm. So take a good, give it a good overall look. And then, as you approach, you know, take extra caution near the propeller. You know, don't stand or let anyone else stand within the arc of the propeller. And uh, <laughs> don't be in line of propeller. I think we can all. If anybody has ever uh, watched Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. you will know why. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
And now open up the aircraft, open the door, and let's do a document inspection. And uh, there is a memory aid uh, with an acronym that uh, we use. And that is called ARO, A-R-R-O-W. The A stands for Airworthiness Certificate. That is required. That's a required document. Registration Certificate. That's another uh, required document. Radio Station License. That's required. Um, that's FCC requirements. Uh, as of January 1st, 1997, uh, the radio station license is required only for international flights. Um, all right, so hold on a minute. So this is usually only this one, this radio license. Yeah. It's only international. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hold on. That is something we need to capture because that is part of the event. We do, we need to have that understanding before we get into all of this. Oh, okay. Um, and then operating limitations. And that's where you could find, you could find that in your pilot operating handbook, which would be in the airplane. And also weight and balance data, and, and typically that's also in that uh, in that handbook, in that binder of information. And so, Mark, what is? What, what, why are you doing that? It, like, if you saw a discrepancy, you know, what is the ramifications of these two things? This is my, primarily two things, financial and uh, maintenance. So if your aircraft is used for hire, it has to undergo a 100 hour inspection. So every 100 hours, it has to undergo an inspection. So it's, it's good for logging that time. And then many um, clubs and fixed pace operators, businesses that rent out airplanes, and perhaps you're an, air, you're an owner and you want to know how much time is spent uh, operating this aircraft, mm -hmm. you pay for it typically by the hour. Jump into this. And some of this um, is so are all So when we say, when you say, you're using the airplane checklist. Is it basically just that air, that that manual that you pointed to? It's going to. Or are there others? There are others. This depends okay. on the airplane that you're going to be operating. So what if some of these components don't actually do what you want it to do? Like maybe it gets stuck or it's maybe yeah. broken. I'm assuming, again, you're going to call it off for that day and get it into a mechanic. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. These are pretty critical things. So yep. if, if they're not functioning, don't fly.
make sure you give your passengers a safety briefing on the uh, so seat belts. According to our event, Mark, you would be giving them that outside of the aircraft while you're still cleaning your windshield. So, what do you do after oh, you clean so the windshield? And now you are inside, going into the airplane. You know you can. Uh, you're ready to start it up. You can have your. You, know, you can still have your door open at this point. You want airflow. Your passengers are now boarded. Your cargo is tied down securely. Okay. All right. So now you can get back into the aircraft and start your pre-flight passenger checks. Go checks, ETC, other models. There.